Now, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd turn with me to John chapter 15, verse 8. We've been in this series called Grow, and this whole year we're going to be looking at the book of John and, and walking through it. And, and we've got our John journals back there, and those are just designed to be a reference and resource so you can read the scripture, you can take some notes, and, and, and just have one book of the Bible with you as we go throughout this. Um, but we've been looking at this passage, John chapter 15, where Jesus is using this imagery of a vineyard. And he's introducing his disciples to this imagery of a vineyard and how our relationship with God is designed to work. And he declares that he's the true vine. And then we, his people, his church, are the branches and we're supposed to be connected to him and living in him. In, in the New Testament, they described it this way. In him, we live and move and have our being. That every part of our life is designed to be connected to Jesus. And then he introduces God as the gardener. The one who is providing and taking care and pruning and shaping and making sure that our lives produce that which he's intended for us to produce. Jesus is having some serious conversations with his disciples because he knows in just a few days he's going to go and die on the cross. And he's been living with them and teaching them for three years about his kingdom. They'd grown up in a religious system and Jesus came and said, my kingdom is different than the ways of this world. And he wants them to live in his kingdom so that they can build his kingdom after he's died on the cross. And he uses this image of a vineyard and this vineyard ideology would have been very apparent to them as they walked through the hillside in Jerusalem and, and traveled from town to town. Even on the front of the temple, the place of worship, there was a golden vine on it representing the relationship of God to his people. And he says, I'm the true vine and you are the branches. And we've been walking through this and what it means to grow, what it means to grow. And, and I was thinking about this this week and uh, I love Granny Smith apples. Anyone else Granny Smith apple fans? The firmness the tartness. Uh, that's my favorite apple. I know there's other good ones, um, but Granny Smith is my favorite, and it's partly tied to my childhood. Uh, my grandfather lived down in Chehalis, and on their property, they had an acre of strawberries. Oh, this, it was heaven. <laughs> Visiting grandpa, and we'd go out to pick strawberries, and, and our fingers would turn red, and He'd look at our bowls and he'd ask, where are all the strawberries? And we'd smile and there'd be strawberries on our teeth and around our lips. We'd say, we don't know, Grandpa. And um, whenever we found a giant one, we yelled the phrase, Caliento Sacramento. I still have no idea what that means. But that's what we'd yell. We'd find a big one, Caliento Sacramento. And we'd find that giant strawberry and either choose to put it in the bowl or choose to put it in our mouth. Not very many Caliento Sacramentos ended up in the bowl at the end of the day. But when we were done picking strawberries, he would take them in and he'd wash them. And then me and my sister, we'd climb into the Granny Smith apple trees. And we'd sit in the crook of that tree in the shade. And being under those branches, the fruit was a lot more evident than when you were on the outside. And we'd grab an apple and we would take that crisp bite in the cool of the shade, and it was heaven. It was glorious, and we always loved going to Grandpa's house. Well, as we get into John chapter 15, verse 8 here, we see that God has designed our lives to produce fruit. To produce, actually, not just fruit, but much fruit. And so John chapter 15, verse 8 here, says this, my father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. My father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit. Turn to someone next to you and say much fruit. Say tons of fruit. He produced much fruit and prove to be my disciples disciples. The first thing I want us to understand today is that what your life is producing is a direct result of where your life is growing. That what your life is producing is a direct result of where your life is growing. Earlier in John chapter 15, we talked about this idea of pruning and how God prunes us so that we can grow. And pruning promotes new growth. It regulates growth. It increases yields. It improves fruit size and quality and maintains 
healthy plant life and vigor, strength for the plant. Hey, but here's the reality. You are going to grow. Life in your life, you're going to grow. Now, where you grow and how you grow and what's produced from that growth is left up to your determination and your disciplines. You're going to grow. You may not grow and like it. You may, not, you may be growing and not like what it's producing, but your life is going to be growing. Even when you feel stagnant, even when you feel stuck, you're growing. You may just be growing and being stuck. Anyone else get stuck and you just hit the gas and the tires get deeper and deeper and deeper? And so you're going to be growing. So what, what direction are you going to grow? If you remain in Christ and you grow in relationship with the Lord through prayer, Bible reading, and service unto others, your life is going to grow and it's going to bear fruit. But sometimes when we look at our life and what it's producing, it's not in a line with the fruit of the spirit, but the fruit of the flesh. And those are two different things. You can't be connected to Jesus daily living with him and growing in bitterness, growing in frustration, growing in being uh, short with your spouse. Growing and being focused on you. Growing and your finances remaining unhealthy. Just trying to wait till your kids turn 18 and you can set them free and they're no longer your responsibility. So how do you grow? And what do you grow in? This last year, um, or, or last couple weeks, I got to go and be with a group of, of friends that we committed uh, 16 years ago to one another. We were youth pastors at a camp and we said, what would it be like if we just committed to making sure we finish life well? And so at the age of 23 to 27 was kind of the age we just made this commitment like we're for each other forever. And that was a great intention. What we realized was over 15 years that we had grown. We had changed. That there was things in life and, and different paths that we had taken and none of us were in the same spot 15 years later than we were where we started. And that growth had caused some change and dynamics to our original commitments. And we found that our time together was no longer producing what we initially wanted it to produce. And so we had a question. Is this still worth investing in? And we had to make changes. We had to say, hey, if we're going to, for me, it was, hey, I love this time with you. You guys are all great guys. But if I'm not going to grow spiritually, if I'm not going to be prayed for, if I'm not going to be um, like called out on some of the things I need to be called out on, if I'm not going to be supported when I need it, then I'm going to take this time and this money and invest it in my family. I'm going to take my kids to the beach rather than be with you guys. But if we're going to commit to each other, if we're going to pray for one another, if we're going to grow in health, then I want this. And so it took us making a change, repurposing and saying, hey, we've been growing, but now we need to change and grow back in the direction we intended. And that's the beauty of church. That's why we teach from this Bible every week. It encourages, it convicts, sometimes it cuts, sometimes it prunes, but it's always keeping us growing in the direction we're intended to grow so that we produce the things that God wants us to produce. You see, in the American mindset, when things get hard, we quit. When we don't like the job, we quit. When we don't like the marriage anymore, we quit. God never designs for you to quit. He designs for you to grow. Because he knew what the disciples were about to face when they were in prison for preaching the gospel. If they didn't grow, they would have quit. He knew that when they were about to enter a town and deliver this good news that people didn't receive as good news and they drove them out. If they hadn't been growing and connected to Jesus, they would have quit. 
And there's so many moments in your life that you'll face the pressure of life, the pressure of your circumstances. And if you have disconnected your life from the heart of Jesus and his gospel and his good news, when that pressure comes, you will want to quit. But if you remain connected to Jesus, if you abide in him, if his word now lives in you, you will continue to grow no matter what the external circumstances is, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And this church, which was left to these 11 disciples under immense pressure, under immense scrutiny, because they remained connected to Jesus, there was nothing that could stop them from producing what God designed for them. It's hard to be the church, no matter what day and culture it was. And sometimes we think, man, it's so hard in this day and age. Yeah, it's always been hard. It's always run counter-cultural, counter-current to the culture in the world. But God's placed us here and he's designed for us to produce much fruit. Not just much fruit, but I'll say it this way. God desires that your life would produce abundantly. That your life would produce abundantly. Agriculture is fascinating to me, and, and I really dive deep down into understanding more, living seven years in Walla Walla. Like, I know things are growing everywhere, and there's an agricultural community even in this area, but our world is not based around agriculture here. In Walla Walla, everything's based around agriculture. As you drive into town and that smell of those sweet onions starts coming from the ground, I've never, like, smelled food being grown. But you drive into Walla Walla, you're like, what is that smell? They're like, that's the onions. Now, usually smelling like onions is a bad thing, right? But in Walla Walla, the sweet onions, it's like, oh, that's beautiful. Where's the flour and the deep fryer? Let's make some onion rings and have a good time. As you see the rolling hills start to turn from green to golden and know that harvest is coming. And one of my favorite things each year was to ride with one of our farmers in the church and ride in that combine and just talk about the process of the year. You know, there's things that they know and understand. They can tell you how much rain has been there that year. They measure rain by the week and by the month. They're like, yeah, we had six inches of rain last month. I was like, is that a lot? I grew up in Western Washington. Sounds like you had a lot of sun. Six inches of rain. I was like, oh, that was a good afternoon um, over here. He's like, well, it's not just the amount of rain. It's the timing of the rain. He's like, a lot of rain when the stalks are heavy and under harvest will beat down and will lose harvest. But you want it, you know, earlier in the spring. And, and so it's just it's this fascinating idea. And so I, I'm going to bring some agriculture to you today. How many apples are in my hand? I heard a seven over there. Pastor Andre, paternity leave has messed with your mind there. <laughs> okay, one apple. It's not a trick question. How many seeds are in my hand? Now, how many apples are in this seed? I mean, we could throw out numbers. I heard 23. I heard abundance. I heard 1,000. Multitude. Multitude. There could be zero, and there could be thousands. This has all the potential to produce thousands of apples. But this could be thrown in the trash today, and it will produce Zero. You see, so many times you look at your life and you just see who you are right now. You see the external. You see what your life has amounted to at this point. And you limit who you are and what God can do in and through you based upon what you see. Sometimes you take the words of others and the perceptions of others and you limit who you are based upon who they say you are, who they identify you to be, what group or category they put you in. But what people don't know 
is that there's a God who's created you, who has placed something inside of you. Gifts, talents, abilities, dreams, vision, calling inside of each and every one of his creation that if recognized, if if, if taken care of, if planted, if matured, would produce abundantly. Your life is designed to produce abundantly for God. Abundantly. There's something interesting about apples in this state. We are known as the apple, the apple capital of the world. And you can go any place in the United States, and you go to a grocery store and look for the sticker, grown in Washington. When I'd go to school in Missouri, I'd always go by the, by the calf and I'd grab a Washington apple. It felt like a connection to home. But these apples don't just go around this nation. They go around the world. That God's created this environment in our state to produce an abundance of apples that goes around the world. If God, the designer of apples, has created you with a greater purpose and a greater destiny than he has this amazing fruit, what can you produce that will be multiplied in you and through you that will be a blessing locally, regionally, nationally, and around the world. That God has designed your life for kingdom impact, that he would be glorified and that your life would produce much fruit, tons of fruit, baskets and baskets and truckloads and truckloads of fruit. And the fruit is the, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. That these would be evident in those that lives are connected to Jesus. That when people bump into you, kindness falls off the tree. That when people cut you off, patience falls off the tree. That when people offend you, Self-control falls off the tree. And what they experience when they're around you, because remember, you are not just known, you are experience. People don't just interact with you, they experience with you. And some of you are a wild experience. Some of you are a crazy experience. Some of you are a loving experience. Some of you are a patient experience. Some of you are a rough experience. But when we are the people that God's designed for us to be, producing in us and through us what he's designed to produce through us, we are his experience to the world. We are his love, his kindness, his grace, his passion, his patience. And that's what he's designed for us to be. When God sees you, he sees all of you. He sees who you are. He knows the gifts, talents, and abilities, dreams, and visions he's placed inside of you. He sees what your life is capable of producing when you're connected to him, and it's greater than anything you can imagine. And this gospel work is a multiplying work. And Jesus has trusted Life Center with his multiplying work. And when people encounter you, what kind of fruit are they experiencing? Maybe it's no fruit. That your life is absent of the things that God has designed for you to, to be producing. It's just not there. You're not spending time with him. You don't know him. You're not connected to him. And therefore, everything that's being produced out of your life is manufactured by you. Can I tell you, God grows way better things in and through you than you do. And we need to be producing what he wants to produce. Some of you people experience you, they experience old fruit. That we look back more than we look forward. Why do we have vision night tonight? To celebrate what God did to meet people and meet their needs, but we want to produce new fruit going forward. Life Center is not about offering old fruit to people. We don't want to be offering last year's fruit. 
We want God living, moving, working through us so that we're offering people is fresh, it's new, it's birthed by the Holy Spirit, and it's life-giving. Jesus came that we may have life and have it to the full. Other times people interact with us and they experience rotten fruit. Do you know what I hate? Rotten fruit. Have you ever had a piece of fruit? It looked so good. It looked so appetizing. And as soon as you bit into it, you know, peaches are one of the most deceiving fruits out there. They look so good, but you bite into it and either it's not ripe yet or it's gone bad. And something that is supposed to be designed to be so sweet and so good is mushy and gross and something you want to have nothing to do about. If you like rotten peaches, we'll pray for you at the end of the service. But what God has designed for each and every one of us is fresh, abundant fruit. Next time you drive through Yakima or Ellensburg, I want you to look at the signs that are advertising the fruit sales. If you find one that says no fruit, take a picture of it, please. Send it to me. If you find one that says now serving old fruit. If you see one that says now serving rotten fruit. No, what do the signs say? Fresh fruit in big, giant, bold letters. Why? Because we like fresh fruit. We want the best. And what people need to experience from Jesus' church, from the people who are called by his name, who have been sanctified because of the blood that ran down from the cross, that we've been made new and made right, they should be experiencing fresh, abundant fruit from our lives. And nothing else and nothing less. That each of us are designed to carry this mission forward. We're going to close with this thought. The life of a disciple lives to glorify God. The life of a disciple lives to glorify God. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, talking to them about remaining connected to him. And if they grow, what he's going to do. And he knows that there's difficulty ahead, but they've made a commitment to their life. Jesus, no matter what the road ahead looks like, we're living for you. We're living for your church. We're living for your glory so that people might know the hope that we've received. In Galatians 2, verse 20, and it says, And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And the proof of discipleship, the evidence, the thing that God is looking for in our lives is how we live and what we produce. It's not how we look, how we dress. It's not what we say if we know the right words or even know the right things to say. It's what Jesus is producing through us. Imagine the gardener, God the Father, coming to you, his branch. Would he find joy in the fruit of your life? When he picked up that branch and lifted those leaves, what would he find your life is producing? Some of you have a hard time right now with you enjoying what your life is producing. There's more strife, stress, chaos than there is the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus wants to remind you that today being connected to him and growing and maturing in him will begin to produce the things that bring God joy. That's why we have our Build Strong, our growth groups. It's because we don't want to stay in the place we're in. We understand that growth is going to continue, but in the context of community, in the context of God's people, together we'll grow and become who God's designed for us to be, and that will bear much fruit. Much fruit. And Pastor Andy, $895,000. Incredible. Incredible. The lives that have been touched, the women that have been housed, the children that have been fed and clothed, local communities being supported, like we talked about last week through CareNet and Olive Crest. 
lives literally being saved. But we recognize God wants to continue for us to grow because the reach we can have by producing more fruit is greater than we're currently reaching. That the needs locally and globally are greater than those that we are currently serving. And we thank God for those that we're serving. We celebrate that. But we also don't sit back and say, we're good now. That's why we're giving to LC Cares again. And that's why we will continue giving to LC Cares again and again and again. And we look forward to that increasing so that we can reach wider and farther than we've ever reached before to affect more people so that the gospel that Jesus is working in and through Life Center would begin to spread. Washington apples should not go further than the gospel of Jesus Christ, than him working through his church, working through us, and it's up to us to lean into him and produce much fruit. And he closes with this in John chapter 15 and verse nine. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in me. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So many of us are looking for joy. And Jesus tells his disciples, your joy will be fulfilling my joy. You see, everything you do for the Lord, everything you do in faith, Everything that God produces through you for the benefit of others, that's where joy comes from. In bringing God, the gardener, joy. I mean, I've gotten some cool reports this last week. Of last week, we prayed for needs, especially around those that were wanting to have kids and had difficulty. And the timing of it, even in the lobby right before service, we had a first time guest their first time in church in a long time, that this was part of their journey. This was part of their story. And they were blown away that their first day in church, this is what God was speaking. That's producing fruit. That's stepping out in faith. That's following him. That's being the people, the church that God wants us to be. So Life Center, Jesus's church, Produce abundantly. Produce abundantly. Grow. Grow in your commitment to Jesus. Grow in the strength of his word. Grow in community with one another. And Jesus will produce everything he desires in and through us. Make your joy be bringing your heavenly father his joy. Greg Boyd in his book, Letters to a Skeptics, writes this. The more we choose something, the more we become that something. The more we choose something, the more we become that something. Choose to grow and trust that God is going to produce in you and through you far greater than you could ever ask or imagine. Because he's placed the gifts, talents, abilities, dreams, visions inside of you. Now it's your job to grow and steward those for his glory.